we are broadcasting our inaugural YouTube video, I guess it would be. This is Cyphalopod. And <laughs> we're your co host, Bo Weingard, broadcasting from a tiny hole in Marietta College. And my co host, <laughs> I'm Corey Clark, uh, an assistant professor of social psychology in the UK. Great. And what we want to do is talk about psychology, philosophy, <laughs> politics, and whatever else happens to be on our mind. We will take you on a path of video discovery. <laughs> and today's episode, the inaugural episode, right, we are talking about bias. What is it? Can you measure it? Can we understand it? Are you biased? Am I biased? You need to say our clever title. Which oh, is yes. <laughs> bias, the dark matter of psychology. And why is it the dark matter of psychology? It's the dark matter of psychology because it's extremely difficult to measure and the best methods we've come up with thus far are still critiqued by many scholars for actually just demonstrating rational uh, reasoning. Yeah, so like dark matter, it seems to be out there and we can detect the effects of it, mm -hmm. right? But we can't actually measure it. Right, potentially, we potentially cannot. Potentially we cannot, although you and I may have come up with something. We might have, we'll get to that. Yeah, <laughs> we shall. Uh, so we should start by explaining how people have measured bias traditionally. Yeah, what is the definition of bias? Uh, don't ask me that. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would be uh, evaluating information in a way that I think we would want to say is irrational in that favors coming to conclusions that you want to believe for one reason or another as opposed to um, actually rationally and dispassionately evaluating the information um, without any sort of preference. Yeah, so an excellent example that I once read talked about how if you're a Yankees fan, that's the <laughs> New York baseball Yankees, and you have a different strike zone for your Yankees picture and for the Boston Red Sox picture, then we would count that as bias. Right. So although we seem to understand it, it seems to make sense in everyday life, when we take it into the lab, it's actually more complicated. So why don't you tell us how has it been measured, especially with regard to political attitudes or, um, I guess, political policy policies? Right. So the classic way of measuring bias is to present people with identical pieces of information that um, uh, either have some implication for their political uh the political leaning. So a good example is um, you read the methods of a scientific study. The methods are the same in two conditions. We're looking at the death penalty, say, and you look at states who had the death penalty and then who got rid of it and did that influence crime. And then you would manipulate whether the death penalty does reduce violent crime or whether it doesn't reduce violent crime. And then you have participants evaluate the methods of the study. So they should be evaluating is it sound to look at states who got rid of the death penalty, which regardless of which condition you're in, the methods are identical. And so right. the argument is that a rational person should evaluate those methods identically regardless of the outcome of those methods. Yeah, regardless of whether it matches their political preference. Right? Exactly. Similarly, for a policy, you present people with identical policies and then you manipulate whether a Democrat or Republican supports the policy and supposedly rational people should evaluate the policy the same, regardless of whether their own candidate or an opposing candidate supports it. Yes, and you keep on using adverbs such as supposedly. <laughs> Possibly because we're saying that we're not actually sure whether people should respond to these things uh, the same way or not. Right. So are we going to talk about that now or do we want to talk about something else first? Yeah, we can talk about, well, should we talk about the meta-analysis? Well, shouldn't we talk about the history of political bias before okay, we good. get into the... Yeah, go so ahead. So why, why don't, I guess we should talk about why, 
so we're interested in bias, I mean, for a number of reasons, right? But probably chiefly we're interested in it because of political bias. Right. And because it it seems so obvious in the real world that people are biased. Right. And we're in the, I mean, you're broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the UK, but we're most familiar with American politics, right? So when we talk about this, we're going to talk about liberals and conservatives, which basically means Republicans, Democrats, or Democrats and Republicans, respectively. Um, So let's talk a little, yeah, let's talk a little bit about political bias, research on political bias and social psychology, or or, uh, research on maybe even political cognition. Yeah, so... So I'll, I'll briefly mention the meta-analysis, but then I'll get into that. So some colleagues of mine at University of California, Irvine, um, conducted a meta-analysis of political bias because we had two potential predictions. One was an asymmetry prediction. And the, re- and this, the prediction is that conservatives would be more biased than liberals. And the reason we had this prediction is because... Um, research in social psychology has traditionally cast conservatives um, in a more unfavorable light. They argue that conservatives are more cognitively flawed, essentially, that they have all of these motivated cognitive tendencies, and this ought to produce more bias in conservatives right. than Conservatives liberals. are fearful, myopic, they need cognitive Authoritarian. Closure. Authoritarian, yeah. right, yeah. All of these Social things. dominant, they have their Low high cognitive social dominance reflection, orientation. All of these yes. things, yeah, yeah. Right. So that would seem to predict that conservatives should be more biased. However, there was a wave of recent research um, sort of demonstrating that these might not all be true, in fact, Liberals might be um, just as authoritarian if you measure it a different way, not using the traditional scales that we've been using in social psychology. Um, it may not be that liberals are lower, are higher in cognitive reflection. It might be, you know, a subset of, uh, I think it was that liberals who voted for Trump, or sorry, yeah, Trump supporters are lower in cognitive reflection, but this was driven by liberals being... Um, liberals who voted for Trump being lower in cognitive reflection. So there are all these like nuances to these findings that people weren't considering before. So this yeah, would predict... We should, we, we should know that social psychology is overwhelmingly liberal, right? right? So most social psychologists are liberal. Like 90-something percent, yeah. Yeah, so Boss and Von Hippel, for example... I want to say these, these, this isn't exactly correct, but it's pretty close. So they surveyed about 400 social psychologists mm-hmm. and found that I think all but two had voted for Barack Obama. That might be right. right. And, and so we're talking, we're comparing, we're not comparing Trump to somebody. We're comparing Mitt Romney, you know, like pretty squishy conservative. <laughs> <laughs> so we've only got two people who voted for Mitt Romney or at least admitted voting for Romney. Now, this uh, other researchers have drawn attention to this, and I think we should give them credit. People such as Phil Tatlock, for example, mm-hmm. but probably this became this this sort of boil, boiling um, recognition that social psychology was overwhelmingly liberal started to pour over the pot, if you will. That's a really bad comparison. <laughs> <laughs> um, when John Haidt. A social psychologist gave a speech at, what was it, 2011? 10, 11? I 10 don't know. or 11? The big social psychology conference around yeah. 2010 or 11. Which is SPSP. So he mm-hmm. gave this he gave this speech, and, you know, he's a pretty charismatic guy, so he gives this very effective speech in which he argues that social psychology is dominated by liberals. Mm-hmm. It causes a lot of liberals to have a meltdown. I was <laughs> there. In the New York t- <laughs> he yeah, had okay, us, he so. had us all raise our hand. He said, "If you're liberal, raise your hand." And this was a room of, I think, thousands of people, social psychologists, professors, and grad students alike. And just about everybody raised their hand. And then he said, uh, "Conservatives," and I think one or two. And it, it, it could be that there are conservatives and they were just afraid of coming forth. Right. But then Yoel sure. Inbar and colleagues conducted, you know, anonymous surveys and found similar, similarly. Right. So couple. So we actually have good data supporting yes. this now. Right. We yeah. don't just have nobody can raise their hand in a, yeah. in a 
auditorium. <laughs> um, and after this, actually, if any of the many watchers of this video want to, they can look up, say, Paul Krugman's response to Hyde's speech, which is fascinating. Um, a lot of other liberals had a really tough time with that speech. But it now seems uh, almost inarguable that we're overwhelmingly yes. liberal and that there's probably a climate of hostility toward conservatives that keeps some conservatives out, right? Yes, they okay. they conducted a study and, and, and many social psychology professors confessed that they might discriminate at least somewhat against conservative, right. against conservatives and things like hiring or, um, yes. Yeah. Right. Things like that. Yeah. So, um, so that leads, after this that realized leads into this criticism, well, let me connect this really quickly. Okay. So the point here was some of these people who have made these arguments that liberals actually aren't more biased or cognitively flawed. Mm -hmm. What they have argued is that because we're all liberals, we just think our cognition is normal and that conservatives are sort of foreign or alien and peculiar and they need to be explained. So so that's what these people have argued. Well, yes, of course, when liberals analyze liberals, they think liberals are smarter. Right. <laughs> and when they analyze conservatives, surprisingly, right, they right. think conservatives are more flawed cognitively. Yeah. And this caused... A, a new wave of data retesting all of the old assumptions um, about conservatives being more cognitively flawed and finding that there might be more symmetry than we previously thought. And right. symmetry would mean what in this case? Symmetry would mean that the cognition of liberals and conservatives is more similar than we right. previously thought and conservatives might not be more cognitively flawed across the board. And so, right. so who are these bold iconoclasts? <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of them. Um, I don't know. So uh, Jarrett Crawford would probably be one. He looks at uh, different levels of, I think, discrimination and things across groups. I think maybe Mark Brandt would be one. Um, I think Penny Cook and Rand have some. Linda Skitka and Anthony Washburn, some of these people. Which is really interesting because I think what's happened now is we have like two two groups within social psychology. You have people who are uh, conservatives are worse across the board, and then you have people who are well, maybe not. Um, right. So you and they're not a, really a new... publishing with each other. They're right, talking right. in their own little like they're reading each other's work, but no one's really working together to try to resolve this issue. Yeah, as far as there I can seems tell. to be a new uh, sort of Although new I think Jared Crawford might have said that that they're trying to do something like that. They're so maybe okay. we'll see. Yeah. But there there tends to be a kind of tribalism about even this issue, right? So mm -hmm. the people who think that conservatives are still more biased get rather angry, I think it's fair to say, at yeah. some of the people who propose the symmetry hypothesis and probably sure. vice versa. Yep. Um, which but is we happen to have on the show today an author on one of the <laughs> most important articles about this issue. So why don't you tell us about that? Okay, so we conducted a meta-analysis. Um, What's a meta-analysis? A meta-analysis is a study of studies. <laughs> so <laughs> we, we combined the data from 51 experiments that attempted to measure political bias in the way that I described before, presenting people with identical information and then manipulating the political implications of that information and then having participants evaluate the, evaluate the quality of that information. And we genuinely did not know what we would find. Um, whether if we you had find, asked me, I would have known. You would have predicted symmetry? Yeah. Oh, I don't, I, I, we discussed it and I don't think any of us really have. Oh, no, I, I don't oh. know what I would have <laughs> well, any, well, yeah, some people on the research team had previously published stuff more in the symmetry domain and others had published stuff in the asymmetry. So, yeah, I think, I, I think we genuinely did not know. Um, and then the results we found were that liberals and conservatives were both significantly biased and to roughly equivalent degrees. Uh, right. So, so there was no statistically significant difference in their level of bias when you add the overall effect size. That is, when you take all of the studies and you add that together and mm -hmm. then you compare liberals to conservatives, right? Mm -hmm. 
Right. Right. And this prompted criticism from John Barron and John Jost. They wrote a critique of our meta-analysis. Essentially, well, they made, a, they made a couple of points, but the one that's maybe most interesting and the one we're going to talk about today is whether these studies demonstrate an irrational form of bias at all. Right. Um, yeah. So do you want to explain their argument there? No, you can explain okay. their argument because you didn't you just read this again yesterday? I did just reread it yesterday. <laughs> you can yeah. probably do a better job than I can. Then. Okay. So the argument is that it is perfectly rational to use your prior beliefs to um, evaluate the quality of new information. So a good example, example they give, an example we talk about, um, is if you present... If, if you, let's say there's a study that was published in a top tier social psychology journal that had like 10 studies in it demonstrating a significant effect of precognition, um, the idea that people can somehow predict the future, then yes. it would be reasonable, it'd be rational to conclude that something went wrong with those methods and the methods right. aren't probably solid methods because... The conclusion is so implausible that it's right to doubt the quality of the information. Right, and so we can print it's the fancy statistics or or logic behind this is comes from Bayes' theorem, right? We don't need to get into the weeds on Bayes, but what we can say is the idea is prior beliefs and prior information about something should affect how we analyze the world, right? So if we are 99.9999% sure that people can't fly without equipment and we're walking and we seem to see somebody fly, we probably wouldn't think, huh, I guess I was wrong. People can fly. Rather, we might be concerned that the mushrooms on our sub sandwich may have had hallucinogens <laughs> in them or something, right? <laughs> because yeah. almost any explanation would be more plausible than that people can actually fly. Of course, that's a, a hyperbolic or a crazy example, mm -hmm. um, but it holds for these, so argue Baron and Jost, right? Because right. if we have a prior belief that the death penalty is not a deterrent and everything we know about the world suggests that it's not. And then you right. say, well, we did this study and we found that it is, according to them at least, right? It's rational to be skeptical of your results. Right. Though right. we would potentially argue that people really shouldn't have strong priors regarding political issues because right. they're so that's, highly ambiguous a lot of the time. Right. So so that's complicated. We can I mean obviously the prior the strength of one's prior about the death penalty should be nowhere near the strength of one's prior about whether people can see the future, right? Sure, yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, so do we want to talk about the pre-principle? Because <laughs> I think it's a good analogy. So so the analogy, this is in a paper that Bo and I wrote together um, called Equalitarianism, a source of liberal bias, and we have the pre-principle, which is the proof of the recipe is in the eating. So even if you were a very sophisticated, talented chef and you were um, very able to look at a recipe and determine whether it's good or not, you might look at a recipe and think that it's a, it looks like it's going to produce good food, but then you follow the recipe and it produces crappy food, then it would be reasonable to then conclude that the recipe actually is not a good recipe based off of the output. Right. So you have a couple of options, right? You have this this recipe, you're like, ah, sure. oh, that would make a tantalizing meal. You make the meal and it's utterly horrific. It's insipid, right? And so you can think, I did something wrong, yeah. right? So maybe the recipe is good, I did something wrong. Mm -hmm. Or maybe some of the ingredients were bad or the recipe is bad. And it's not irrational to think something went wrong, the recipe is just bad. I misjudged the recipe. So right. similarly, in the case where we're using these methods, these methods are the recipe. And actually, this kind of goes back to something Meal argued, right? In some sense, methods are a recipe. It's like, yeah. this is how this is how you you work with nature to get this kind of a result. Mm -hmm. So even if the methods seem 
plausible to me ahead of time, if they give horrible, you know, horribly counterintuitive results, then I might think must be the methods were bad, must be there was something flawed about the methods. Right. So this. So that's the. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So this this applies to these methods type studies, which um, I think is exclusively what Barron and Jost focus on in their critique. There are two other types of bias studies that are in the meta-analysis. One of them is a policy type study. So this is, um, you read a, some policy and it's forwarded by a Democrat or a Republican. Um, but I think you could make a reasonable argument for that one. Wait, as well. why, don't you, why don't you explain more in more detail what, what you mean by that? A, a policy type study? Yeah, yeah so yeah. What, what is the logic? Yeah, so, so um, participants would read about a policy. Sometimes the policy is something that participants would be familiar with. So other times it's very ambiguous. Um, right. And then they manipulate whether a Democrat or a Republican is forwarding the policy and then measure how much do you support the policy. And you find that Democrats support policies by Democrats more than Republicans, and Republicans support identical policies more when they're supported by Republicans than Democrats. Right. So the policy might be like, should we make a new bridge on the college campus? Sure. It could be like right. that, but it could also be, it could be something about something people care about, abortion or the death penalty or uh, right. Generally, you get, yeah, yeah, you get a larger effect when it's a more ambiguous policy. So bridge on a college campus, people probably don't have terribly strong priors about. Right. Um, so you get, there you get more congruence with party. Right. Um, yeah. But you could argue that that is perfectly rational as well, because you're using your party as a heuristic, you trust your party. So if I'm reading an ambiguous policy about a bridge, I don't know, I don't care about this bridge, I don't know anything about it. But if right. my guy says he's against it, and I trust my guy, there must be a good reason, something I don't know. Right. So it makes sense in some in some way that... In you, some cases, yeah. yeah. Not always, but yeah, in some cases. Right. So did... Did Barron and Jost bring up that criticism about those kinds of studies? They didn't, um, but we did bring it up, or I don't think they did anyway. I, I didn't see it in my rereading, but um, we brought it up in the original publication of our meta-analysis, and mm -hmm. then we bring it up again um, in our response. Um, but then there's a third type, and this is actually the most common type of studies that are in our meta-analysis, and I think it's actually the best type. Um, and I call these principles. They're harder to define, really, but they're judgments about which people probably should have principles. So a good one is um, participants evaluate a ballot mark, right? So mm -hmm. maybe you're supposed to fill in an entire square and a person just, there's a, a line in the square. And should that line count as a legitimate vote? Mm -hmm. And people are more likely to count that vote if it's for the person they support than if it's for a person they um, oppose. And right, and what's important about those kinds of principles, right, is that most people would profess to have objective principles. Right. That is, if you ask most people, they wouldn't say, yeah, I don't care, I'm going to count it, I'm going to be more uh, easy, my criteria will be easier if it's for my party because I want more votes, right? Right. And you could... I really do think if you if you you really could defend this, you could say, well, it's perfectly rational to count the exact same line as a vote if it's for your party than if it's for the opposing party because you expect your guy to get more votes. And so probably more sure. of these ambiguous votes actually were intended to be. So you can you can make that stretch. I think it gets to be a little bit ridiculous, but you still can go there and say that, you know, even these Pol uh, these principle types, those don't demonstrate bias right. either. And, uh, no, another ir thing irrational that, bias. Yeah. Right. Now, I think I think we would both agree that they probably do, and there are some examples. They probably do what? They illustrate bias, right? There are probably some examples that are pretty difficult to justify or rationalize from that perspective. Yeah. One important thing about the principle bias, though, is... It might not be as interesting to some people because it really just seems like a basic form of tribalism. It's not actually about certain beliefs about the world, right? 
in some sense. So it's basically just hypocrisy. Yeah, my side can do it and your side can't, right? Yeah, but I think probably people would still care about. So like one of oh, them, I'm not, I, one of I these agree. types. Okay, so so tell me what you think about this one. So one of these types of studies is um, the use of dirty campaign tricks by either a politician you support or a politician you don't support. Is it right. okay to steal lawn signs or is it okay to do robocalls to try to trick people into not voting or something like that? Right. And people say it's more okay for their own side to do it than the opposing side. And I think right. you do want people to have principles on these issues. Or the same thing, same thing with the president. Like, uh, you shouldn't want you shouldn't want people to think that it's okay for the president to do certain things if it's their guy, but not the opposing guy. Yeah, I wasn't suggesting that we should all go Machiavellian, <laughs> but I do think it's a different. It, in some ways, it's a different kind of bias that's mm -hmm. perhaps not as interesting because I think it's more obvious. So, for example, we have a my family bias, right? Mm -hmm. And so, obviously, I would judge my family less harshly than I would judge other people. And of course, I would proclaim that I have these objective moral principles, but we all kind of know that we don't, right? We judge our friends less harshly than we judge the out group, et cetera. So, I mean, again, it's a bias, but it's probably not as interesting as biases that suggest that but, we actually process but, information differently. Yeah, but here's a question. Mm -hmm. If we are admitting that these principle type judgments are, by, are a demonstration of bias, that tells mm -hmm. you people are biased. Yes. which tells you that when we're looking at these other types of studies that are more susceptible to rational counter explanation, why is it, or at least it, it seems to me, that the burden of proof falls on the bias researchers to demonstrate that these are biased, given what we know about the world, given that we know people are biased, why, why is the, the default position that if we can explain it rationally, that's why people made that judgment? Because we can explain it rationally, and that's still not why people made that judgment, right? So it could be bias, even if, you know, researchers like, you know, really cognitively sophisticated people can point out, no, 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 like, it's so possible that, that it's rational. The null should be... I mean, are you saying no, the, the I, null hypothesis, which is like we set up to contradict, or we want to show that the null is not true, let's say. So you're saying the null shouldn't be, there's no bias? I, I don't know. But I don't know either. It is but interesting to me matter, that it seems we've decided that the null should be. There's I no think bias. we've decided the null should be when it's our team that's biased. <laughs> <laughs> and when it's the other team, yeah. we're like, yeah, that's obviously biased. Yeah, that's almost certainly So true. we're biased but about But that's rational. <laughs> we're rationally biased about our biases, yes. Yeah. Um, so, right. So we would agree, though, again, that the in the case of principles, it seems pretty clear that people are hypocrites. Now... I guess what's interesting is this question. Is it really a bias if the people understand that they're being somewhat cynical about it? So let's say, for example, that I have a different strike zone for my favorite baseball team. Now, I think you could argue it's, def it's a cognitive bias if I, I'm not aware that I have a different strike zone. Mm-hmm. Right. So let's say I, I, I call strikes that I would never call for the other pitcher. And I'm like, yeah, that's the strike zone. One could imagine a situation, though, in which I'm perfectly aware that I'm giving strikes to my guy that I wouldn't give to the other person. Right. And that right. would just be hypocrisy. Right. And not bias. That would be cynicism, basically. I highly suspect, though, I don't know this for sure, that that is not what people think they're doing. Oh, I agree. So. Yeah. This fits with Von Hippel and Trivers' argument about self-deception, right? Which is, if I want to persuade you that something is true, I should believe it myself because it makes me a more uh, it makes me a more fervid believer. It makes me more dedicated, and it makes it so that you can't see that I'm lying because I'm not. Right. And my own convincing. head, I'm not lying. Yeah. So, in other words. <clears throat> 
it's hypocrisy. <laughs> It's a hypocrisy and it is a bias, but maybe the bias evolved so that basically it's self-deception so that you could better convince other people that you're actually committed to an objective standard. Right. And what we do know, so we had, uh, as part of our response to this critique, we had participants evaluate whether these types of things are biases. So we had, we Mm -hmm. asked them about the method studies, the policy studies, and the principle studies. And almost everyone said all of them are demonstrations of bias. What right. we so also people know, think that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so everyday people consider these to be uh, demonstrations of bias. We also know that people will not admit that they are biased themselves. So this is the bias right. blind spot effect, which is one of the most replicable things in my experience, is even if you tell people about bias, and even if you basically demonstrate to people that they're biased, they will they will never admit it and they'll never right. so change now this, their judgment. This makes sense from a, a persuasion point of view, right? Because sure. if I admit that I'm biased, I've just ruined any chance of persuasion that I have, right? So people <sighs> yeah. should be very reluctant to admit that they're biased. Now, we should mention the Baron and Jost comment. So Jost is, I think we said this before, but he is famous in social psychology for depicting conservatives, some might say as horribly myopic, parochial, fearful people. Um, He has a a famous article entitled Social Social Conservatism as... No, it's conservatism as motivated social cognition. Social cognition, something Something such as this. Right. Now, to, to be fair to Jost in the article... He and his co-authors note that liberalism may be motivated cognition as well, but clearly Jost thinks that conservatives are much, much more susceptible to motivated cognition. And, and he would also and, admit that liberals are probably biased and sure, but, but flawed I, in some ways. But right, what li- I was conservatives to, are worse, probably. Yes, and yeah. what I was trying to get at is their comment to your meta-analysis. They were, it was a fiery comment. I've read it, and they were upset because they don't agree with the symmetry hypothesis. They think that conservatives are indeed more biased. In fact, Mm -hmm. they might even think it's dangerous to suggest that the symmetry hypothesis is correct. It does seem to be in the paper. Well, they think, look at the world, look at what's happening. How could you, how could you possibly say? That right. liberals and conservatives are similarly biased. It doesn't make sense. Right. Um, and one thing that I've said that I do want to mention, I don't think we were planning to talk about this too much, but I think there's a tendency to think bias is the cause of more problems than it is. So right. I've always said this. We've had this running debate, I think. Um, one might look at Uh, American centrists and compare them to the average Nazi and find out that there aren't any differences in bias. They're about equally biased. Of course, Nazism was a pernicious ideology and American centrism is (laughs) awesome. So it's bias doesn't necessarily lead to pernicious ideologies. And it's not necessarily even if we got rid of all bias, we might still have hateful ideologies, right? Sure. Here's an idea. So this is something I've been entertaining lately. What if the problem isn't that people are biased, but that we call people out for being biased and we don't like it when other people are biased? So the fact that everyone thinks that these are biases and the fact that this is what people whine about in the media all the time, the example I was talking to you about earlier was... Um, John Stewart had a bit on Fox News uh, calling Obama out for the latte salute. And then he shows that Bush uh, saluted the troops while holding a dog. And he's this is exactly the type of judgment we're talking about here, where why is it okay for Bush to salute the troops while holding a dog, but not okay for Obama to hold the troops uh, or to salute the troops while holding a latte? And so he is accusing them of hypocrisy or bias. And he was pissed off. And this kind of stuff pisses people off all the time. And so who who was who was who was uh, 
apoplectic. Was that Stewart who was irritated? He was pissed off at Fox News for making right, a big okay. deal about this. And right, for, right, sure. Well, he was pissed Be, off. And, they, and what he there was were some saying, other things going on, too, but but that was the, right. the overall issue. Right, and what he was saying was Fox News is it's just a bunch of hypocrites because mm-hmm. when their guy does it, nobody cares. But when Obama does it, they he, act as though it's an outrage said, to the military. Yeah, yeah. He even says, yeah. you have no principle on this. He right. wants them to have a principle. And I think we do want yes. people to have principles. And so whether these are biases or not, or whether these biases are rational, let's say, or whether they can be explained as rational, regardless of whether they actually are. Right. It causes a lot of political conflict, and yes. we know that for sure. So, sure. So, what I'm suggesting is maybe the bigger issue is not that people are biased, but that we refuse to accept that in other people. I'm going to take a hard opposition to that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I actually think the fact that we get outraged by hypocrisy and bias is good. Okay. It's. I mean, it, I mean, it probably obviously. Is. It doesn't solve all problems, obviously, but one thing that um, one thing that Mercier said, he's a, a social psychologist, I think he's a social psychologist. He he and Dan Sperber have this theory that reasoning is for arguing. And I don't know if or, or rationality, reasoning, whatever. I don't know if I fully agree with them. But one thing he noted in one of the articles that he wrote was ad hominem attacks are actually a good way of making people abide mm-hmm. by the principles that they forward. So it may be that when we're, when we're clashing politically, we're just trying to persuade people that our side's right. Mm-hmm. But we do so by forwarding principles that we're then in some ways bound to. Because yeah. if I say, here's the principle and I try to persuade you with it, then somebody's going to use that against me if I disobey the principle. Right. Right. And that's actually good because it's a way of making objective standards that we care about. Well, it's probably good, right? I think probably, sure. Sometimes sure. its principles probably could be applied only sometimes, and that might be better. But yeah. Yeah, in that, general, that might it's be. Right. Probably. Good and for one thing that's maybe obnoxious that you, you know, so you were giving this example of John Stewart. So mm-hmm. John Stewart could have said, well, you know what? Yeah, it was wrong for Obama to do that. Like, maybe he shouldn't have done that. I'm not saying it was. I don't have a strong opinion. But he could have said, you know what? That probably was just wrong, and he shouldn't do that. Right? So this is yeah. a kind of whataboutism. It's like, how mm-hmm. dare you even say this? And in in some sense, you're ignoring whether the complaint is true or false, because you're just saying the other person's acting as a hypocrite. So it doesn't really right. even matter. Right. But I think then you do still have to admit that bias is a problem, right? Yeah. I, well, you were just what, saying what that your 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 I don't know if this is your hot take, but that bias doesn't really matter and it's not the problem. Oh no, it's it's I, not I, really contributing to political oh, no, no, conflict. No, I, no, 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 I didn't. That's not what I. That's not what I intended to okay. say. What I what I meant was. Bias isn't the only problem, sure. right? And, and in fact, you could imagine a group without a lot of bias and a group with a lot of bias, and maybe the group with the bias is better. They're, they're more moral. They're more humane. I don't know. But yes, right. obviously, bias is a problem because it, in some sense, it chips away at these objective principles that we forward. Right. So it's like, yes. yes, we like these objective principles, but then bias gets in the way and you let your own team get away with it. And then when you legitimately get called out, you just blame the other side for being hypocrites instead of dealing with the issue. Right. 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 Um, I would agree that other things matter as well. And something that the Baron and Joe's comment mentions is accuracy. So liberals could be very biased. Um But if their beliefs are more accurate, it almost doesn't matter because they'll be right more often. Um, The issue, I think, with that argument is that a lot of these studies, there really isn't an accurate judgment. Most of them are pretty ambiguous. They're presenting some new piece of information that people really shouldn't have priors about. 
Probably, um, yeah, right? Yeah, I think so. Um, but, yeah, the example we talk about sometimes is, like, LeBron James' mom might be biased toward thinking he's the best basketball player of all time, but it doesn't matter at all because she's right. Okay, so that's true. I wouldn't go so far as to say it doesn't matter because if the underlying reason for her belief is she cares about accuracy, then we can predict that in the future she will be more accurate. If the underlying reason for her belief is simply because it's her son, then we can predict she won't be accurate in the future. Yeah, and that's something important to to tease apart. Um, right. One issue that might be relevant to discuss here is, so Dan Cahan has uh, research that, I'm, I'm not sure if it's been replicated extensively or not, but that people who are more expert, well, this is also related to the reasoning is for arguing, um, people who are more expert or more knowledgeable are often more biased, and that's because they're better able to justify their positions or rationalize their positions. Right. And now notice that that, in some sense, that's a bold argument, it a is bold, bold assertion, right? It is bold. Because according to this one, you might expect to find more bizarre beliefs among people who have IQs 130 and above than who have, say, 100 and below. I'm not sure that that's true, that you well, would find more bizarre beliefs. You well, would... what would you predict then? So if he's claiming that smarter people can be more biased because they're better able to justify their biases. It wouldn't necessarily be bizarre. It would be whatever those people want to believe would be the dominant narrative, right? Because they would be able to convince other people. So it wouldn't be that they would have more bizarre beliefs. It would be that whatever they want to believe would be what they believe. And they'd be really good at convincing other people. Uh, okay, but they would be more... You, what one, one would expect... Yeah, that that's true. I, I accept that. But one would expect then, right, that they would have more self-promotional beliefs and they would be better able to defend those beliefs. Well, there might be competing motives, so... I'm not sure that that's true. Sure, but... Because people, you know, you know. people who are really cognitively sophisticated probably also care about their identity as being smart and rational. And so they also have to at least appear that way more. Maybe. Right, so that might be a check on that. Maybe. Because I've, I've maintained this. This is Here's my hot take okay. for, for episode one. <laughs> <laughs> Tune in next week for another outrageous hot take. I think if the elites, and I'm using the word loosely, but people basically know what I mean by this. If the elites promoted the belief in witches actively, you could still have people burning witches or drowning <laughs> them or executing them. The reason the world doesn't believe We look this witches, up, right? Don't people, still a substantial proportion of people believe in witches? It's something yeah, like, so it's like 17% it's something, or something? Yeah, 17, let's say it's 20 Shockingly high. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, and that's, that's with an elite who are committed mm -hmm. to the idea that witches do not exist. So right. imagine if the elite started promoting that they do exist, mm -hmm. right? So I think a lot of the gains the intellectual gains, and that means a lot of the loss and superstition since, say, 1700, since the Enlightenment, is a result of elites. It's not yeah. common people, and I'm not trying to derogate the common person, but it's, it's really the elites. So maybe they could be more biased in the lab somehow because they're, they're better able to articulate or, or you know, uh, harness arguments to defend their beliefs mm -hmm. but it seems as though for whatever reason and to defend their bias by claiming it's rational yes, in convincing and, ways yes yeah. and and we would both agree and actually we talked about this in equalitarianism that educated elite certainly have some silly beliefs or for example blank slateism appears reasonably popular among the elite and it's probably almost as absurd as belief in witches. We could debate yeah. that. Is it as dangerous? Probably not. But some people might argue it is. Well, let's say this. Communism. 
<laughs> now, communism is every bit as ridiculous as belief in witches, and it's probably more dangerous. I defend the idea in a different population. <laughs> Yes, non-humans well, that's, that's fair among non-humans <laughs> it, uh, totally totally it didn't work it did work on the animal farm <laughs> just yeah, saying well. well here's here's something so if if Kahan is right that experts are more knowledgeable people more cognitive well, sophisticated wait, wait, people may I may I pause just for a moment does now does he make that claim or does he just say some evidence suggests does he does he think it's true he has a couple studies demonstrating that yes right but we don't know what if we asked well i guess we don't know so we should be fair to him if we does he make is the article arguing that it's true or is it just here are some hypotheses and it turns out in these studies that uh, I more cognitive i don't recall okay so i don't know okay um, all right but anyway, so he, at least he would say that it's sometimes possible. Yeah. What's interesting about that is then it could potentially be true, uh, Jost could be right, that conservatives uh, have relatively simple thinking or something like that. But that might make, that doesn't necessarily protect liberals from bias. It could actually make them more biased, right? Sure, right. So right. that potential explanation could could mean that the meta-analysis is right, that liberals and conservatives are equally biased, but Jost is also right, that conservatives have this sort of rigid thinking, simple thinking style. Yeah, so, so it could be that these cognitive traits are orthogonal. That is, they don't, they don't, in fact, not that they're orthogonal, yeah. rather that cognitive sophistication is positively related to right. bias. And the issue is yes. that now, this doesn't seem to match the world, at least from where I sit. <laughs> How do you mean? Well, that is to say conservatives, especially in the Trump era, I, and by conservative, I'll hear I'm talking about Trump voters and mm -hmm. not all of them, obviously, but a lot of Trump voters have obviously erroneous beliefs, right? Right. That seem to be... Uh, the result of bias, probably. Liberals have some weird beliefs, too. Oh, as, <laughs> as we said, blank, blank yeah. slateism, for right. one example. Um, right. Probably conspiracy beliefs about Trump and Russia, although some of those might be true, to yeah, be fair. I don't to want know. to comment before the Mueller investigation <laughs> is over. Um, but yeah, you're right. right. And that's actually a good point. And I don't know, did you... I guess it's a good point to note that even if Jost is correct and that mm -hmm. conservatives have a higher need for cognitive closure and they're they're more fearful of death and fearful of threatening stimuli, etc., it could be that liberals are more biased. Yeah, so here's uh, his first argument he makes in the paper, or their, their first argument, is that the sample of topics we used aren't representative of all of the potential topics about which people could be biased, which is oh, fair yeah. enough. Um, right. So but we similarly, say why, because that's an important point. Okay, we can we can come back to that, but that that's a fair point. They they probably aren't representative of all the potential political topics we could investigate, but the same applies to um, the psychological traits that he examines. He looks at a handful of uh, psychological tendencies, but he doesn't look at all of them. He doesn't look at all the ones that could be related to bias. We don't even really know what psychological tendencies do predict greater bias. I don't, right. I'm not familiar with any research that looks at what personality traits would predict more bias. And then right. there could be dozens or hundreds of them and they could be found in equal degree or in different degrees in conservatives and liberals right so so yeah that's a that's an excellent point so what one thing baron and joe said is that the psychologists who were doing these studies on bias were purposefully basically selecting issues that you would find mostly symmetrical bias because that's more interesting for what they were doing 
right? Right. They wanted to find that everybody was basically biased, right? Right. Or, so or there could be. These bias researchers were probably wanting to demonstrate bias sort of generally. And so right. then maybe they would try to pick topics where conservatives and liberals would look similarly biased. Right. And so that that's distorting your meta because people aren't doing bias studies on, say, birtherism or something. Right. Um, we argue that that is actually probably the most fair way to measure bias because you want to have you want to give both groups opportunities to demonstrate bias by selecting issues that they mo they both care about. It could be true that. Um, liberals and conservatives both identify with their their in-group in roughly equal degrees or something but liberals could be more sensitive to uh, actual policies whereas conservatives could use party cues more often right so just because they both identify with an in-group it doesn't mean that they're both going to show that type of in-group favoritism to equal degrees when they're trying to evaluate a policy right. or a scientific study or whatever it may be so they are these studies do look at issues that liberals and conservatives might have similar preferences for, but right. at maybe going back to your um, going back to your Yankees example, you could be a huge Yankees fan and still evaluate strikes in an in an even manner, right? Could right, yeah, yeah. yeah so it, it's not there's no reason to think that even if they did pick these issues. Uh, on which both liberals and conservatives care, right. about which they both mm -hmm. care, it doesn't necessarily follow that you should find bias. The reason you right. find bias is because it's there, right? Right. Um, and I had a thought. It may have escaped me. I think I was going to deliver hot take number two because I couldn't help myself. Unfortunately, I what we were talking about before. Unfortunately, hot take two actually disappeared i do not have it anymore okay, which is, back to you. um okay so the point is here that that's another argument about why the meta is flawed right now one argument that i've raised is possibly it doesn't make sense to add all of these studies together mm -hmm. and say there's equal bias, right? Perhaps it would say, like, what we should do is look at specific domains mm -hmm. and say, on the domain of affirmative action, liberals are more biased. On this domain, conservatives are more biased. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't actually feel that strongly about that argument. And in yeah. fact, it might not be true, but in, it's worth in our In our response to the this critique that was conditionally accepted a, a couple weeks ago, I think, and is under review again now. Um, we make that point that it probably doesn't really make sense to say that it doesn't really make sense to say to support symmetry or asymmetry, because it's going to almost certainly be moderated by all kinds of things. Um, right. So, so, and Jarrett Crawford does some of this. He looks at different areas where liberals will be more biased or where conservatives be, will be more biased, and they'll be more biased wherever they care more than the other group. Right. Um, we didn't find any significant moderators, but I think probably we would have been underpowered to do that. So um, there, there almost certainly are multiple right. moderators, and it could change over time, too. Right, and then an, an, another potential argument that I like, I don't know that you liked it so much, against this claim that there's a, a skewed sample of issues because th these researchers were trying to find overall bias, just right. general bias, right, is a, an argument against that is these are also predominantly liberal researchers and therefore they take a lot of things for granted and don't even think that they're biases, right? So they wouldn't even ask things that liberal related to mm -hmm. blank slateism, I think. Not complete blank slateism, but especially like group differences or sex differences right. where there's reason to think liberals are more biased than conservatives. They wouldn't even ask those because they don't think those are biases to begin with. Right, and liberals probably when they look at the world and they see 
where bias is, they see it in conservatives. So they would maybe pick topics that conservatives would be more biased on because those would be the topics that seem like they would they would they would get the best results if they select those topics because they can see it in the world already, right? Right, right. But um, that's speculative, you know, we don't know. Yeah, a- absolutely yeah. speculative. And we should say that it appears that there's a lot of moral <laughs> moral emotions flare up when we talk about this bias. People Mm -hmm. seem to want to say that some group is more biased because it's a bad thing to be more biased, right? Right. And that seems important to people, and that's one reason people get so worked up about this. Right. And it's not necessarily true, but maybe it's true. I don't know. And what we would say, I mean, so another thing that's worth thinking about is it may be that on average conservatives are more biased, but that conservatism is right. And I guess we talked about this earlier, right? But it doesn't undermine the conservative political philosophy, right? Even if the people tend to be more biased on average. Right. I suppose you would want to think that if if bias is actually irrational, you would want to think that rationality would converge with the truth at some point. It might take yes. a while um, and you might have false beliefs for very long, especially when it comes to politics, when there probably aren't truths about a lot of these issues, really. There's just trade offs and it's what do you value more? But um, you would want to think that rationality would converge with the truth. Do you mean that utilitarianism didn't solve all of those problems? Because I thought it did. I don't think there are, I mean, trade-offs, no, you just do utility calculus. Yeah, but people would uh, ascribe different different weights to different outcomes. I read Bentham and I get the utility calculator and then I go from there. <laughs> yeah, it's not think, even that hard, really. But also with politics, there there are consequences are always unknown before something happens, right? They are, but I'm I will say I am not particularly fond of the different values argument, really. Okay. So I think ultimately we ought to be able to come to close to a consensus about what really matters. And then when we go from there... Okay, how do we do that with abortion? <laughs> yes, okay, so what you would have to do is or get... Or gun control, for that matter. Well, gun control, I, I do think you could. So notice, people who are... But you making, have to the, balance autonomy. No, hold, no, I, no, because I don't... Okay, so how many people make this argument? You know what? Yeah, we'd save like 300 lives a year if we had more gun control, but I don't care because freedom. I don't think there are many people making that argument. You don't? I haven't heard it. No. I mean, what are gun gun rights supporters all about? They would say that actually Yeah, it you're right. They do they do say right. that. In the same but way is that, that the real really... reason or is that just what they think the reason is? If you could persuade these people, let's say you you could show them for sure that it costs 300 lives a year to have the gun laws that Mm -hmm. we have. I don't think many of them would be willing to say, yeah, that's fine because freedom. Yeah, because they appeal to, they say you're actually safer if you have a gun. They would say more people should have guns because then we can take down the people who are. Right. Causing harm, yeah. Same thing with the Second Amendment. Would anybody say, you know what, turns out guns are terrible for society, but the Second Amendment, so we can't do anything about it. Well, some people do say that, but maybe those, I don't aren't, know maybe those aren't the most rational people. Very very few people seem to do that. I mean, maybe you're right. Maybe a few do. Now, abortion's probably different because there you do have arguments about what seems to matter, although it does seem to me that both sides care about harm or suffering of the the fetus. And so one thing that abortion, anti-abortion activists attempt to do is show that the fetus experiences pain. Right. Right. Anyway, that's a not, we could, yeah, that's, that's a two hour. We're not going to solve these issues right now, <laughs> right. probably. Right. No, Bentham already did. We don't need to. Okay. Done. <laughs> Um, 
So do you want to talk? So I guess maybe a way to transition into this is we would potentially predict that because social psychology has so many liberals that they would potentially focus more on issues that conservatives might be biased about. Um, right. And then we had a study in the meta-analysis that had the, the, the most relevance to victims groups. And this was a study that involved affirmative action and same-sex marriage. Liberals care a lot about groups that they perceive to be treated unfairly by society. And that yes. study demonstrated one of the largest differences where liberals were vastly more biased than conservatives. Yeah. Um, and so we did uh, conducted a series of studies looking at this. Um, my favorite example, maybe uh, from the real world. Uh, let's let's pre preface this, right? So to say what we think liberals care about very uh, strongly that maybe conservatives don't as much is what have been called victims groups, mm -hmm. right? So victims groups are, are groups that especially liberals perceive to be victimized by society, such as Muslims, African-Americans, women sometimes, mm -hmm. um, et cetera. So th those are victims groups. And what we think is liberals are particular, they have a sacred value about protecting victims groups, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and given their their preference for equality, um, yes. they, they desire for all groups to be roughly equal. Um, yes. Yeah, so the example that I like to give for this one, you might prefer the Demore example, but the example I like is this Ted Hill paper um, that was accepted to be published and then rejected after the fact twice because presumably liberal um, academics had an issue with the hypothesis for it, or, or rather the topic, I guess, which was greater male variability. So the reason liberals wouldn't like this is because if there's greater va variability among men than women, then when you look at the absolute top end of achievement, so like uh, Fields medalists or Nobel Prize winners, you're going to find more men than women, and that's not due to discrimination, potentially, right. or not entirely due to discrimination, let's say, right? and potentially somewhat due to actual differences between groups. And this is right. threatening to liberals because that means that we might not be able to make men and women equally represented at these top ends of achievement. Right, and yeah. the example that I like better, of course, <laughs> is the was the firing of James Damore for writing what I consider almost a milk toast document. Right, so so he wrote this document. He didn't intend it to go public. It was an internal document at Google, arguing that Google's diversity policies did not take into account genetically caused differences between men and women and one that he cited that got a lot of attention with, but which is just empirically true and has been confirmed multiple times since he wrote the document was that women tend to be more neurotic than men. Mm -hmm. That is, they're more likely to experience unpleasant emotions. And he said, we have to consider all of these differences if we actually want to make an effective diversity policy. This was leaked um, I don't know who leaked it, but it was leaked onto the internet and within days he was fired. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then what I really liked was that I think it's the National Labor Board, something like that. They, so Demore brought a suit against Google and what the board said was contending that there are genetically caused differences, that this is not verbatim, this is my summary, is tantamount to sexual harassment. So merely, if it happened that the world is such that men and women are different, <laughs> which it happened that way, <laughs> then stating that fact is sexual harassment, which is utterly astonishing, right? I mean, this really is, is... very sexist. Right. In other words, nature is sexist. Maybe it is. I don't, I'm not sure what that would mean exactly, but yeah. But I mean, this is really, truly is 
akin to Stalinism. I mean, I don't want to, obviously, we're not living in a Stalinist dictatorship, but these kinds of things are, you are forced to believe things that are manifestly untrue, otherwise your job may be in peril. And that is incredible. And notice this is about a victim's group um, concern. Pe people's concern seems to be that there would be more women in programming, right, computer programming, mm -hmm. if it weren't for the sexist and toxic bro culture, right? Yeah. That, well, that, and it uh, doesn't mean that that's not part of... Right, reason, exactly. Right? So yeah. it, it could be that there is a sexist culture, let's say at Google yeah. or among programmers. We don't know. And as and, you... Yeah, go no, ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> well, just that it could be that there is this sexist culture, yeah. but also there are genetically caused sex differences, right? right? And in fact, my guess is there's a little bit of both, and that's fine. And I don't think Demore would dispute that. In fact, he went out of his way in his document to talk about everybody's biases, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't necessarily know that I agree with uh your analysis of whether Demore should have been fired or not you know i think who i did i say he should i mean that's the, the problem is that's a complicated question because yeah. we inhabit a particular world in which people were outraged so i understand why google right. did it i would like to inhabit a world in which people are outraged about stating pretty simple scientific truths <laughs> such as that well, anyway. women are more neurotic than men right uh anyway so so we conducted a series of studies where we were testing whether um, liberals have this particular bias where they are opposed to um, biological differences between groups that appear to favor privileged groups or groups they perceive to be privileged groups over victims groups. And we found this privileged repeatedly. Groups and white men only. <laughs> yeah, white men are privileged groups. Right. So we found this repeatedly. Um, and we were really trying to think about how can we determine whether this is a bias or is it uh, maybe it's right to be skeptical of any information that favors powerful people because powerful people control the information. And, right. And I yeah. think that's actually a reasonable hypothesis. Yes. Yeah. By the way, we're, we're sort of saying it in a derisory tone, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, I think the reason we try to think about it so carefully is because it actually is a good argument. Right, because we took these things seriously and we, we wanted to figure out, yeah, how can you actually show that this is a bias? Mm -hmm. And so the solution we came up with, which I thought was my idea, but it turns out other people have done this before me, and it's even possible that I read those papers and just forgot about it, but um, we tried to do this. So t traditionally, bias studies are done between subjects where participants are presented with either politically congenial or politically uncongenial information only. And so we tried to do this within subjects because that would allow us to determine whether people think the manipulation ought to influence their judgment. Um, right, that is to say these people are getting both vignettes, mm -hmm. right? So, for example, I think in our, maybe in our final study, we had them first read about a gene that explains why men have higher IQ than women or why women have higher IQ than men. And we'd found in previous studies that liberals consistently rated it as... Uh, rated that study as uh, implausible or I f what, did, what do we call it? I forget what our DV is called. Let's say less plausible, the methods were worse, whatever. Something we put like this that. together. Lower quality. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. So it was yeah. lower quality when women were less intelligent. Yes. Um, so we wanted to determine whether that was a bias. So we had people evaluate both and either they first would get the argument that men have higher IQ and then women higher or women higher than men higher. And if you see an order effect such that they anchor their second judgment to their first, this would indicate that they realize that they should not allow which group is said to be higher to influence their judgment, um, even though they do. Right. right. And so we ended up finding significant order effects, which indicates that people sort of realize at least that it looks bad to treat those conditions differently, despite that they do. Right. So they they get the let's say they get the 
men are smarter first. Mm -hmm. And let's say this is, I'm a liberal and I read that and I'm Mm -hmm. like, no, these methods are shoddy. This is a bad argument. Then I get the same exact argument and it says women are smarter. And yeah, I and you said something like along that. the lines of we 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 tricked you. We we right, gave you the study right. and we just said it was the result was different. But right. here's the but true here are result. the real results, yeah. right? And then so suppose I get this now women are smarter, and I kinda like that, but I'm like, man, I just said I read the same exact thing and I just rated it pretty low. So mm-hmm. I shouldn't I shouldn't go too high on this one. So you find that that average is lower than if I get women are smarter first. If I do that, I'm like, yeah, these are good methods. And then I get men are smarter. I'm like, well, I just said it was pretty, you know, a pretty good method. So I have to say it again. So then you find that those are different. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be a good way of getting around what we brought up early on, the Bayesian problem of using prior information, right? Because here, the people are telling us basically through their responses that they think it would be biased to answer differently. Right. And I'm not sure that this resolves the issue a hundred percent because that assumes that what people think looks biased is what is biased. And that's not necessarily true. Um, Yeah. That is to say, it may be that people think, oh, this would look biased if I answered this way, even though maybe they think it's the right way to answer and maybe objectively it is. Right. So because of the need for argumentative consistency, that is is possible, we think, right? Mm -hmm. But that's the best we've come up with. (laughs) (laughs) So ultimately, bias remains a kind of dark matter that surrounds us is is everywhere especially in people i argue against (laughs) and we yet cannot measure it as well as we would like to and on that profound note i'm going to end this conversation okay that sounds good